Honorable President of India, Sri Pranav Kumar Mukherjee Ji, Honorable Member of Parliament, Rajya Sabha, Sri Hunasar Kalita Ji, Respected Officials of Rastrapati Bhavan, and my dear student friends from Guwahati University and postgraduate East Indian Board members of Guwahati University. It is a great privilege and honor for Guwahati University that Honorable President of India has given us an opportunity to visit His Excellency and Rastrapati Bhavan. I welcome you all to this memorable and historic meet. The Guwahati University was established in 1948, the only oldest university in the northeastern part of India, serving the students and society for the last 68 years. The campus is around 600 acres, having 45 postgraduate departments, an institute of distance and open learning, an institute of science and technology, and a constituent law college in the campus apart from other academic centers. There are around 6,000 students undertaking different courses in the campus. Apart from this, there are more than 3 lakh students in around 350 affiliated colleges enrolled for undergraduate and postgraduate courses in the faculties of arts, science, commerce, engineering, fine arts, law, management, and technology affiliated to this university. There are more than 400 teachers and around 1,500 employees serving the university. The university is ranked 22 among overall institutions and ranked fourth among all the state universities in India. Your Honor, the great personalities like Krishna Kanto Handik, Dr. Bhavananath Saikya, Dr. Surjo Kumar Bhuya, Dr. Bani Kanto Kakoti, Dr. Bhupen Hazarika, Dr. Jitranath Goswami are the noted alumni of the university. The ex Chief Minister, Sri Tarun Gogoi, and the present Chief Minister, Sri Savandra Sanwal, Sri Bhavanasar Kalita, present MP and Vice Chairman Rajya Sabha, are also the alumni of this university, producing a good number of political leaders in the national level. The Guwahati University won many prizes in the cultural arena and sports sectors in the national and international level. Though this university is situated in the remote northeastern part of India, it is a matter of great pride that the university is ranked fourth among all the state universities in India. It is possible only for the continuous, unsparing, untiring efforts of entire students and the teachers' community. But due to the financial problem, the university unable to satisfy the growing demand of the entire academic structure. Today, the Guwahati University students' representatives desires to focus some educational issues before your honor with a lot of anticipation for the betterment of the students' fraternity in particular and the society in general. We believe your experiences, advices, and suggestions will be highly beneficial for us. We are hopeful at this historic meet will yield a positive and constructive result for the entire Guwahati University family. Once again, I highly honored and thankful for this opportunity to put forward our view points before your honor. And with this, I would like to conclude my speech. Thank you, sir. Jai Hind. Respected Honorable President of India, respected MP, sir, Kalita, sir, and distinguished members of the House. It is my pleasure to speak in front of dignitaries like you today. Availing this great and rare opportunity, I want to share my experiences and thoughts regarding some potent aspects of the higher education and present social scenario of Assam. First of all, I want to speak a little about the present status of our university. Regarding Central University status of the Guwahati University, sir, 
As the oldest university of the entire Northeastern region, Guwahati University has been serving the cause of higher education of the people of this region for nearly 70 years now. However, due to the aging infrastructure, inadequate faculty strength to support its expanding academic programs and inadequate budgetary provisions, the university is currently facing a formidable challenges in fulfilling its mandate. As a state university with the state government funding, its current financial allocation is grossly inadequate compared to the funding received by the two central universities of Assam. In order to address such gross inequality in the form of inadequate resources, on the one hand, an educational mandate for a much bigger number of UG level students on the other. We strongly feel that Guwahati University needs to be accorded the st status of a central university. This will solve many of the chronic problems that this heritage institution is currently facing and enable it to better utilize its excellent credibility and quality benchmark for the greater academic benefit of the people of the state and the region. Secondly, regarding the setting up a Rhino Research Center, I want to elaborate a few points. The indiscriminate, sorry, sir, the indiscriminate killing of the unique one-horned rhinoceros for which the state of Assam is justly famous has raised mass pain and concern among all sections of the people. While we feel that a multi-pronged approach to the issue is required, we also believe that proactive measures are the need of the hour. One such measure is the develop, deployment of the Indian Army in the Kaziranga Wildlife Sanctuary for providing the required level of protection for the preservation and welfare of this noble animal. A second proactive measure is to approach the matter in terms of institutionalized planning. With the existing resources and trained manpower at Guwahati University, we feel that setting up a rhino research center would enable such a planning for the conservation and safety of the rhino. The proposed center can be worked in collaboration with the concerned government authorities on issues of security concern, offering an academic perspective and support for the efforts already initiated by the state government. We request your kind in intervention in moving the concerned ministry of the central government to initiate the planning and implementation of the proposed center as early as possible. With these few words, I would like to conclude. I thank Mr. President sir, and Honorable MP sir, and you all for your kind attention. Now I request Sipina Kausikbora, our General Secretary, to share his experience. Honorable President of India, first of all, I'd like to extend my heartfelt gratitude on behalf of the entire Students' Fraternity of Assam. It is indeed a historic moment for the university as we get the opportunity to share our views in front of you, sir. In context to the words shared by our Director of Students Welfare, Gohati University, I'd like to share some points concerning our students' fraternity's ideas and views, which are due permission, sir. Sir, as mentioned by our Director, sir, I'd like to share with you that we Assam have seven state universities which deal with the general courses. We the Guwahati University have around 350 affiliated colleges under us, and every year around 2.5 lakhs potential students complete their graduation from these colleges, and a very less amount of students are joining the university for post-graduation and other higher studies. The amount of, is around 3,000, that is 1.5% of the total graduates per year. We have been witnessing a problem of access to the higher education in our part of the country. As per the UGC report on higher education in India 2008, the gross enrollment ratio in higher education in Assam is 8.8%, which is below the national rate of 10.8%. Sir, since we have to tackle these emerging problems, we the university is trying to provide higher education through distance learning programs, but it is not bringing a good solution to the problem. We are still unable to touch the remote rural areas of Assam. 
So we, a bunch of students from our university, along with the help of our teachers, are suggesting to extend higher education programs to the remote areas of our place by creating some nodal points in these remote places, those peop which will work as an e-hub also where those people who are not aware of the different programs that are being offered by our university can be linked to the university. The mod nodal points come e-hubs can create a connection, a link between the less aware and the university. The plan is to create valuable human resources. As a part of these suggestions, we the students are also planning to volunteer the program in a routine manner. If we are able to work on these plans, then we can move further and work on creating innovation centers along with the hubs for encouraging new ideas and entrepreneurship in those places. So one more point I'd like to share with you that in our team, we are constituted of five toppers from five faculties of our university. But unfortunately, only three of them have accompanied us. The two other two could not come on time due to the present devastating flood scenario in Assam. In this context, I'd like to share some of my views. Sir, though flood in Assam is a common phenomena, I'd like to bring to the notice of your honor on this issue because it is a perpetual disastrous phenomena which has affected lakhs of people in the state across 27 districts. My aim to raise this issue is to highlight the plight faced by thousands of students during the flooded season. As this age-old issue has not seen the daylight of solution, we, the students of Gohati University, would like to suggest an idea of establishing a research center in Gohati University to prevent erosion and articulate infrastructural solutions to prevent floods. This research center would be an epitome institution and one of a kind, which would include not only the students of the region, but also the local people, as they would be key resources for understanding the ground issues and give solutions. Lastly, sir, we, Gohati University, is proud to inform you that we are the national winners for the last three consecutive years in folk dance and folk orchestra in National University Festival. Last year, we represented our nation in Southwest, that is South Asian University Festival, performing a brilliant folk dance. This year also, we are selected to represent our nation in folk dance and folk orchestra in Southwest, going to happen in Malaysia. Sir, in this context, I, on behalf of the university, would like to put a suggestion regarding the establishment of an institution. The institution is about Indian cultural studies. The in northeastern region of India has a home of 300 ethnic tribes, representing an incredible mosaic of cultural diversity. The Indian Cultural Studies Institute will help us in knowing all the beautiful cultures of India to its depth and will also help us to preserve our indigenous cultural heritage. If properly planned and implemented, this institute can serve as a model for the country. So with this, I conclude my sharing session, extending my heartiest thanks to the Honorable President of India, the officials of Rashtrapati Bhavan, and Rajya Sabha MP, Mr. Bhuvaneshwar Kalita. Thank you. Good morning to all of you and welcome to Rashtrapati Bhavan. <clears throat> Though it is called Rashtrapati Bhavan now, after 26 January 1950, but when it was constructed, it was constructed as the residence of the Governor General and Viceroy of India. The students of history will notice that when this house was constructed, that was the height of the British imperial power. The house construction began before the First World War. It was completed after the First World War came to an end and before the Second World War began. And at that point of time, British naval power, both civil and military, were unparalleled 
in the whole world. So naturally they proudly used to call rule Britannia rule waves all over the world, all the oceans and seas, they have their control. But they had to leave this house within 16 years of its first occupant, Lord Arwin came. And thereafter, as you know, the capital was transferred from Calcutta to Delhi in 1911. From 1757, after winning the Battle of Plassey, and thereafter, another 10, 15 years, they won large number of battles, particularly the battles of Arcot at South, and a few other battles winning. More or less, the East India Company was able to establish its firm control over north, south, east, and west of India. But as they established their commercial headquarters at Calcutta on their arrival, they continued to rule this vast territory from Calcutta. And what is now known as Rajbhavan of Calcutta, that was the government house. Governor General used to live in that house. The house was constructed sometimes in 1787. But formally, they started the British administration from 1774 under the first Governor General of Warren Hastings. And they established two other governments. One is government at Fort St. John in Madras, now known as Chennai. And another government was at government at Bombay, now known as Mumbai. These two governments were subordinate to the government at Fort William, which was called, that was the official name of the government of India at that time. So from, 19, uh, from 1774 to 1911, almost 137 years, Calcutta used to be the capital of British India. Then it came here. And we call it Rashtrapati Bhavan. Simply, we did not occupy it after the British had left. And the office of the President of Republic was created through the Constitution of India, which we adopted on 26 January 1950. But the history of contemporary India, say from the end of Second World War, to the latest day, to this day. This building has witnessed many momentous changes in our history. They are the silent witness of the transformation from a colonial country of 190 years to an independent country because the transfer of power took place, an adjacent hall known as Darbar Hall, at the midnight of 14th, 15th August, 1947. Then it converted itself into a republic. After the adoption of the new constitution in the Constituent Assembly, which is now Central Hall of Parliament. In that building, the Constitution of India was drafted. It took almost three years. The first work began in the 6th of November, 1946, and the work was completed on 24th November, 1949. 
It was adopted, of course, on 26 January 1950, the first Republic Day. So this transformation was a silent transformation, but nonetheless, it has far-reaching impact on the life of the people of a vast multitude of Indian population. So I am glad to welcome you, the young budding minds coming from the university, I am acquainted with the Kohati University because it was established at a very famous college, Cotton College, which produced many brilliant students and national leaders. As Kohati University is the oldest university of the Northeast region, Cotton College was equally the most important institution in those days in the whole region, including what is now known as East Pakistan, uh, East Bangladesh. Then it was known as East Bengal. Large number of students before the establishment of the institutions in Dhaka, they used to come and have their education in Gohati Cotton College. It had its reputation. You have made reasonable progress, I will say very good progress, from its establishment in 1948, with only 17 affiliated colleges. Now you have more than 360 number of students have increased. Number of faculties have also increased. And you yourself have highlighted some of the points, including your director, Mr. Kakati. And they have stated certain issues you have raised, like Rhino Center, Central University, development of infrastructure, establishment of Northeastern culture centers. In fact, I do feel already two central universities have been established in Assam, one in at Tejpur and another Assam University at Silchar. Uh, assuredly, the Ministry of Human Resource Development, which is primarily concerned with the establishment of the central universities, they can look into it. But two, three other issues which we have raised are very important, and I am glad that you are thinking. The future leaders of the country are thinking about these problems. Unicorn rhino is not only a very rare specimen, but this research center will open a very wide horizon of environment, rhino, its properties, and the uniqueness of this unicorn. Very recently I visited an African country, which is also famous for rhino, but they were all too hot. And I met a couple of them, and you know, rhinos do never run away seeing the visitors. They always, they may stop, they may not attack you, but they will not run. They are very courageous, and always in the challenging mood, especially to the man that come, I am ready to fight with you. So I saw many of them, they organized a tour at the sanctuary. But unicorn rhino is very rare, and only we have enough. So it should be further and particularly for the preservations. These are the real victims of the pochar. And these minutes, 
law and order is to be strictly enforced, poachers should be stringently punished, so that this precious natural wealth is preserved. And Dasham has many such specimens. With the growing population, a reduction of the forest areas, expansion of the cultivation areas, the problems of the and danger to the wildlife are becoming more serious. So these issues are to be addressed. Second issue which you have mentioned, I also feel it is very important. That cultural center of the Northeast. Gohati University is the proper place. We can establish it there. Though now each of the state has its own central university. All the states, we have established a central institution, including Nagaland, Arunachal. <coughs> but Govati University, if you have, it is not only the nerve center of the Northeast, it is also the gateway to India, gateway to East India, East Asia, our look east approach, main get a central point of this approach is to go. Therefore, if there be a cultural center, and large number of ethnic groups are there, more than 300 ethnic groups live in the northeastern India. Many of them are not yet counted and enumerated. They are very small number, maybe 15, 20, living in such inaccessible areas. Sometimes our attention is drawn during the time of election. For instance, last time, there was one election booth where there were only two voters. And for that, the polling party had to go. And polling party did not consist of merely the government officials, but including the representatives of the political parties, candidates, because how they will reach there. On the border of China, there is only one in a village. Population is very few, maybe about five, six, and two of them were voters. So these were identified, but there may be many more areas many more ethnic groups, number maybe 15, 20, or 100. They are not anyone. So, research center will facilitate us to expand our knowledge and also to take the appropriate steps. Because in our policy making, as you may be knowing that I spent many years of my life in administration as ministers, ministers in the government of India. When I entered into the government of India, I was just 34. And today I am 81. All the years I was not minister, but I was almost 25 years in different ministries. But the one great deficiency I saw, that we did not have the inputs adequately before taking a decision. I think for the first time I introduced in 1982 that before I budget, I would like to have interaction with some people. So my officers identified four groups, economists, industrialists, agriculturists. Agriculture economy is important. And some NGOs and others who are active. This was quite inadequate to represent 128 crores people. Four or five groups are not adequate. But we began. Now it has been expanded. Many more interests come with the technological communication imp improvement. There have been substantial changes. 
So we shall have to work on these initiatives that at least the policy makers, research centers, universities, there should be a close nexus. I have introduced a system, I don't know whether you have noticed it or not. I address the vice chancellors and the students on two occasions in a year. Once in the month of January, when the new year begins, I wish my new year, good wishes for the new year. And once I will be addressing in the August, when the academic session starts. Through the knowledge networking, and I address from here, they listen, and thereafter they put some questions, questions they send earlier, and I respond to those questions. Questions come from the students. So, this facility is available. Those who wanted to do before me, who were president, they could not do so because this facility was not available. With the technological change, every day new facilities are coming. And we shall have to take the advantage of this new facilities. You have talked of faculty shortage, inadequacy of the infrastructures. All these are important issues. But we can also solve some of the problems. Infrastructure, of course, we shall have to expand it. But for example, faculty, nowadays, through the e-networking, it is possible to have the lecture sitting in your classroom. A professor, when he is delivering his lecture in MIT, adjusting the time differences. Or a professor, when he is speaking in Cambridge Trinity College. These were the institutions, MIT, Trinity College, Cornell University, Harvard, Oxford, Brussels. <coughs> Istanbul. Istanbul University was established in 1421, long before the Al Hazar in Egypt. Al Hazar in Egypt was established in the 1500. 16th century, but Istanbul was 1421, at the height of the Ottoman Empire. So these are the institutions. Some of our institutions are coming, and amongst the, I don't know, you must be aware of it, amongst the newly established universities, Govati is doing very well. I congratulate them. And they are emerging as the very fast moving, and one day you will find that they will find their place with Calcutta, Delhi, and Bombay and Madras. They are moving so fast. So this tempo is to be kept. Faculty shortage we can address through our electronic sol solution, technological solution. But physical infrastructure, classrooms, computer, electricity, other facilities, that must be provided. And here the government of India, state governments have many major tools. Thank you very much for coming. I have taken a little longer time than I intended to have, but I always find the young budding minds. Who knows? You may be occupying one day this place. Fakhruddin Sahib came, he became the president, first president from in that sense, in the Eastern India, though Bihar, somebody claimed that it is also part of Eastern India, Rajan Babu was there. But after that, Dr. Fakhruddin Sahib is the, was the, he was representative of yours. He became the president, and he became the president in the 70s, very successful president. He was a very successful minister, very successful president. Who knows, some of you will come 
and occupy this place one day. After all, everyone has immense potentiality. I do not know your personal background, but you are coming from an edit university. I came from my one of the most remotest village. Every day I had to walk five kilometers up, five kilometers down from my village home to my school, to reach the school, a high school. Not to speak of any <laughs> elite institutions. Because there was no other institutions. That was the only available. And not one or two years, six years. After my graduation, I did not have access to electricity. We used to read in the kerosene lamps. Nowadays, facilities are being expanded, but much more. Because the knowledge, origin of the knowledge is expanding so fast that sometimes I am mesmerized. It is mind-boggling. The knowledge of an underground student nowadays have. We did not find that knowledge in the teachers of the underground classes in the earlier days. When I had the opportunity of interacting with the young students, the intelligence, the capacity to absorb, the inquisitiveness, the queries which they put, simply encourage us that we are truly advancing and our youngsters, the most bright point of it that our youngsters are surpassing us and they are moving much ahead without any baggage. I wish you to carry it on. Thank you and wish you best in your lives.